Daly, thanks very much. Now, part of the House Rules Committee hearing on the Defense and Emergency Supplemental Spending Bill. The portion includes testimony by House Appropriations Committee Chair Bill Young and the Appropriations Committee's ranking member, David Obey. It's about an hour and a half. Come to order. We are uh, here for the consideration of H.R. 3338, the Department of Defense Appropriations Act for fiscal 2002. And I'm very happy to welcome the distinguished chairman of the Committee on Appropriations. And uh, I uh, would like to, to say that, uh, first of all, I would like to, to commend uh, our colleagues, Mr. Walsh. It's been submitted by Mr. Walsh, which I support, will increase the amount of the $40 billion in emergency supplemental spending that will go toward New York's recovery from $9 billion to approximately $11 billion. I also want to uh, heartily commend our, our colleague, Chairman Young, for his skill in bringing to the full House a bill that adequately addresses the needs of our military during this time of war. It addresses the homeland security and economic recovery needs of our country in the wake of the September 11th terrorist attacks. It further uh, as honors the agreement made uh, with the President on October 2nd to keep total discretionary spending no more than the $686 billion that the President uh, uh, referred to. It's imperative that we resist attempts to use the events of September 11th to justify unrelated and unnecessary spending increases on discretionary government programs that will already be increased by 14 percent in fiscal year 2002. The President's noted that the administration is currently not able to spend or even obligate all of the emergency money they now have on hand. If at the appropriate time next year the President determines that more resources are needed, he has made it very clear that he will not be bashful in asking for additional supplemental funds. I share the President's view that wasteful deficit spending poses one of the biggest challenges to our efforts to turn this around. I want to say that uh, we welcome uh, Mr. Young here, and I know we're going to be hearing from a number of members of the Appropriations Committee and other members as well. Hope everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving, and uh, it's our hope that as this appropriations work gets uh, completed, that we will be able to uh, finish our work in a timely manner so that we can all go home for the uh, holidays. And uh, before I call on you, I'd like to see if uh, Mr. Frost or anyone else has any uh, remarks they'd like to make. Mr. Chairman, um, at the appropriate time in this hearing, uh, I will offer an amendment uh, that was offered by Mr. Murtha in committee and that was rejected in committee, mm -hmm. which will provide increased funding for, to combat bioterrorism mm -hmm. and will also provide increased funding for our troops who are currently in the field right now in Afghanistan. Um, Mr. Mr. Obi, of course, will be offering a broader amendment covering uh, some of these subjects and other matters. Uh, and Good. I know that we will listen very carefully to my colleagues from New York. Uh, I've had the opportunity to, to take two trips to New York uh, since September 11th. I've had the opportunity to visit uh, Ground Zero. Uh, and to have a, a pretty good feeling for what's happened to that city as much as any outsider can. And we also I know that you've personally will, done your part to help rebuild the city over the Thanksgiving break. The, uh, both of my trips were at my own personal expense, were not at the government's expense, mm -hmm. and uh, my wife and I have contributed sub significantly to the New York economy. That's, That's appreciated correct. by everyone, that the New York correct. delegation and those of us across um, the country as well. I, 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 think, I hope that we will listen very carefully to our colleagues from New York, uh, because this is a matter that needs to be addressed and needs to be addressed adequately and fully by this committee and by this Congress. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Mr. Frost. Mr. Young, we're very happy to have you and look forward to your testimony. Well, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Frost, thank you very much. It's always an honor to be uh, here before the distinguished members of the Rules Committee. Uh, today, I'm uh, representing my subcommittee chairman, Jerry Lewis, from California, who is uh, on his way back from California after having enjoyed an interesting Thanksgiving week uh, 
there in California. But normally he would be here presenting this bill since he does chair that subcommittee. Mr. Chairman, uh, let me describe the, the, the bill in, in two parts. First, the, uh, the $317 billion, which is the basic defense bill. Uh, this, as usual, is, was developed on a truly bipartisan basis with Chairman Lewis uh, and, and the ranking member, Jack Murtha, working together with all of the members of the subcommittee uh, to make sure that we worked together, that we consulted, and the defense bill was voted out of the subcommittee and the full committee unanimously, with no amendments offered to the chairman's mark in either instance. This was not only because of the way this bill was put together, but because of what it does. You may know that the defense subcommittee was actually beginning its subcommittee markup of this bill on the very morning of September 11th. When our country suffered the horrific attacks on New York and Washington, the subcommittee was actually in this building, uh, prepared to mark up the bill. Uh, we were evacuated, as uh, any of the other uh, residents of the building were, and our markup was put, put off till a later date. These attacks have changed so many things, and I can report that this defense appropriations bill was reworked by the committee following the tax, as well as the onset of our military operations overseas to reflect the new demands of the war on terrorism, as well as the other challenges we confront around the world. Just a few examples. The committee recommends significant increases in funding for our intelligence community. Indeed, an increase in percentage terms of more than 10% from last year's levels. Uh, in do doing this, we followed the lead of the Intelligence Authorization Bill, which under the leadership of Chairman Goss, a member of your committee, passed the House by an overwhelming margin. Likewise, the committee has strongly supported those initiatives proposed by the President in his budget, which deal with the new threats of this new century, ranging from areas such <coughs> such as ballistic missile defense to force protection measures for our troops in the field, and new equipment and technologies, such as aerial refueling aircraft and unmanned aerial vehicles. The defense bill also fully funds the president's initiatives in the area of military pay and quality of life programs, such as the largest military pay raise in 15 years, and more than a 50% increase in funding for the medical programs supporting our troops and their families. Finally, in the major defense bill, we are proposing a new appropriations account dedicated to counterterrorism and new threats. And in that account, we add nearly $1.7 billion over the president's budget request, ranging from more funding for intelligence to providing additional resources in the area of so-called cyber war, computer network protection, et cetera. And even while this institution is still coping with the effects of biological terrorism, the anthrax attacks, I would tell you that the defense portion of the bill before you adds nearly $500 million over the president's budget for improved equipment and research to counter the threats of chemical and biological weapons. So all in all, the defense portion of this bill that we are bringing forward, even though it is not the legislative measure intended to address the immediate costs of the war on terrorism, is one that enjoys strong bipartisan support, is not controversial, and most importantly is a bill which the committee believes provides strong support for our troops, both in the immediate circumstances they find themselves as well as the longer-term security challenges confronting our nation. The bill before us, Mr. Chairman, also includes a division allocating $20 billion in emergency supplemental appropriations enacted as part of the Emergency Supplemental Appropriations Act for recovery from and response to terror attacks on the United States. This spending allocation, however, is the source of controversy on this bill. There is broad-based concern that there is not enough funding to address our homeland security, recovery efforts, and humanitarian assistance related to the September 11th attacks as well as law enforcement efforts to bring those responsible to justice. As you know, we have an emergency spending pot of $40 billion passed in an earlier supplemental bill. $20 billion of that is allocated in this bill. We have discussed what is needed to secure our country from future attacks with experts in and out of the administration, from the FBI to the CIA, from Customs to the Coast Guard, and I must confess, I am especially concerned about some of these problems, and I've expressed these concerns to the President. We all need to understand that the President, as Mr. Dreyer has said, 
has said he will veto anything above 20 billion in this title. And I just don't believe it's in our national interest to have that veto take place at least not at this time. I understand that a decision has been made by the leadership in support of the administration not to allow a rule that brings to the floor of the House a bill that allocates more than the remaining $20 billion of the supplemental. So in my opinion, the question before us today is not how much, but when. We all know there are needs out there that still need to be addressed, and I've advised the President on many of those, as have many of my colleagues. But we expect that there will be another supplemental request from the administration to address the balance of those needs early next year. I would also like to point out that next week our country will be commemorating the 60th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. I understand that in the aftermath of this attack, President Roosevelt requested supplemental appropriations at least seven times over the year following this attack in Pearl Harbor. I suspect that this first request by the President that the Congress has responded to already will not be the last. So today I'm asking that a rule be granted that will permit this important legislation to move forward so we can get it to the Senate and conference it as soon as possible. Critical funding for our military during a time of war and for homeland security and recovery efforts is at stake. Your committee must now decide how the House should consider this legislation and work its will. And Mr. Chairman, I'll be happy to respond to any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to add my congratulations to a job well done. It took a long time and a lot of negotiations and on some very difficult issues, and I'm pleased that we have the bill before us tonight. Thank you for bringing it. <coughs> Mr. Diaz-Blart. No questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Frost. Well, Mr. Chairman, there are a lot of things that uh, <coughs> there are a lot of things that that I could ask, uh, and we have a lot of witnesses uh, that want to testify. I would ask you about one item, if I may. Um, we have a letter, actually, we have two letters. Uh, one from Mr. Waxman uh, in his individual capacity. Um, this is addressed, uh, dated uh, November 26th, addressed to Chairman Dreyer and to myself. And another um, dated November 27th uh, from Mr. Waxman and, and other members. Um, this relates to money necessary for the Postal Service to purchase equipment, to screen mail uh, for anthrax. Uh, it appears from Mr. Uh, Waxman's two letters that um, there is money uh, to cover the Postal Service's needs in the OB amendment, but there is not sufficient money uh, in the base bill that you presented to the committee. Could you comment on that at all? Now, Mr. Frost, be, I would be happy to comment on that and, uh, and suggest that not only in the case of the Postal Service, but in other areas, I believe that there will be additional money required. And as I said in my prepared statement, I made that case as strongly as I could to the President of the United States. Uh, his decision, as supported by the leadership, uh, is that when those needs are immediate, that he would ask for a supplemental. Uh, I have committed to moving a supplemental very quickly uh, at that time, and I think we can move it very quickly. Uh, would I like to see some additional funding in this bill? Y yes, there, I, there are areas that I would like to see more funding. Uh, I would tell you that the Public Health Service is overtaxed. I would tell you that the uh, Border Patrol is overtaxed. I would tell you that immigration is overworked. I cannot tell you enough about the Coast Guard, how many uh, new and additional responsibilities they were given almost immediately uh, without uh, what, what, in my opinion, would be sufficient funding uh, for the long term. I would like to uh, point out uh, very emphatically the tremendous work that the FBI has done. Uh, it is, uh, as has Mr. Roby, and I'm sure he'll mention that to you. I have visited uh, in, their, uh, in their intelligence and operational control center. I know the tremendous job that they've done in identifying uh, leaders of the Al Qaeda who are, who are hidden away in many remote parts of the world. And so the answer is yes, there, in my opinion, there will be additional funds. But I'm also prepared to uh, take the president at his word that he will ask for that supplemental when he feels that it is necessary and that we will, we will react quickly. 
I would also say to you that while this bill is dealing with the, with, with the second tranche of the $20 billion uh, initially appropriated, there was that first $20 billion that has not totally been accounted for, that the President has considerable leeway. That is the first $10 billion. Uh, he could spend it any way he wanted related to the, to the emergency. Uh, the second $10 billion, he could basically uh, do it the same way, but he had to consult with the, uh, the appropriations committees of the House and the Senate at least 15 days prior to releasing those funds. So yes, uh, as chairman of this committee, I believe there are additional needs, but also as chairman of this committee, I'm prepared to take the president at his word and that uh, when it, it becomes necessary, the request for a supplemental will be made and we'll move on it quickly. Well, I'm not sure that I fully understand the criteria because it would seem that the Postal Service's needs are immediate and, and necessary at this time, not at some future time. Um, <clears throat> and of course, as you know, whenever we uh, adjourn for the year, sometime in the next several weeks, uh, we Hopefully. will come back on January 3rd only briefly, and then we will adjourn again until January 22nd. Um, and then, of course, we have the President's uh, week uh, uh, in mid-February. We're not going to be here very much in the next um, two months. Uh, I just wonder when you would expect to see a supplemental to cover this and other um, emergency pressing items. I'm not sure that I can answer when the President might send that request uh, to, the, to the Congress, but, but I'm satisfied that when it does arrive here, we will move it quickly. Uh, the first year that I was, had the privilege of chairing a subcommittee on appropriations, a supplemental request for Bosnia uh, was, was coming. Uh, we actually were able to pirate a list of what they needed, and we actually prepared that supplemental <coughs> bill before the President's request ever got here. Uh, so uh, the, the, your Appropriations Committee can move out smartly uh, when that request comes. And as I said, they have the first $20 billion, some of which has not been allocated yet. In addition, we're just at the beginning of the O2 uh, Appropriations Bill, so the money is there to be used. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's an immediate situation that developed tomorrow, there is money in the agency accounts uh, from the O2 accounts that could be used. So, I, I, I think what I'm doing is agreeing with you that, yes, there will be need for additional money, uh, but suggesting that uh, I'm willing to take the president at his word and uh, hear from him. There's only, only one commander-in-chief at a time like this. Uh, I think he's doing a great job in prosecuting the war against the al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Uh, his FBI is doing a tremendous job in locating uh, terrorist organizations, disrupting their ability to function, and doing everything possible to prevent a September 11th attack from occurring again. And I just, uh, I think that it, I'm prepared to work with the President on this. Chairman, if I may, um, on this matter of the Postal Service, uh, and Mr. Uh, Waxman has identified $1.1 billion as the need for the additional equipment uh, screening for anthrax. It's my understanding that that money will cover equipment for the Postal Service, but will not provide any money to the military to screen military mail. There, Even Mr. if the OB Amendment were passed yeah. in its current form, there would not be money for the military to purchase this similar type of equipment that the Postal Service would be purchasing. Well, Mr. Frost, I think you will be asked uh, this evening to uh, report out a rule that would, uh, that would allow several amendments to be offered. Uh, one that would deal with homeland security, one that would deal with the, uh, with the military, uh, and another, I think, to deal with, uh, with New York. And that's something we haven't discussed here this evening, but, you know, I'm committed to uh, whatever it takes to help New York recover from this terrible tragedy that they experienced. Uh, in addition to that, the state of Virginia and, uh, and our Pentagon, I'm prepared to do all of that. And I would tell you that the, the things that you're talking about, the committee is already looking into those. Uh, we have, uh, in fact, at one point, Mr. Ruby and I had prepared a, what would have been a bipartisan amendment uh, that would have covered many of the items that you're talking about and that he will talk about today. Uh, but when, when the President asked us to, to withhold on that, uh, then I chose to uh, support the President. And I just want to be clear about one thing you said. Um, I believe I heard you say that the Republican leadership uh, will have the Rules Committee 
not make in order amendments that would exceed the $20 billion because of the President's veto threat, that you will, your, the Republican leadership is going to ask this committee to close the door and not permit amendments to be made in order if they exceed that figure. Is, is that what you said? It is my understanding that the uh, that I haven't seen any communication between the leadership uh, and the Rules Committee. Uh, my communication to the Rules Committee asked for an open rule uh, with uh, with waivers of the Budget Act because of the $18.4 billion budget amendment that the President sent to us, uh, which is included in the $317 billion. Uh, and we would need waivers for items that are not authorized in as much as the Armed Services Committee, which authorizes for us, uh, have not completed their conference yet. So, but basically we ask for uh, an open rule. What if the, uh, what happens to the OB amendment if it's, if it's too big uh, to fit the President's uh, qualifications? Uh, are you asking us not to make it in order because of the size of it? I uh, think that would be something that the Rules Committee would have to make a decision on. Well, I understand we'll be making the decision. Uh, the question is whether you, as the chairman of the committee and members of the Republican leadership, are going to uh, ask us, and I thought I heard you say that, uh, not to make in order amendments that would exceed the figure that the president has said he would sign. That is my understanding, and in my prepared statement, that is what, exactly what I said, that I understood that the leadership uh, in support of the president's position would ask the Rules Committee not to allow amendments that would go over the $20 billion that is included in Part 2 of this appropriations bill. That would uh, seem to close the door to an awful lot of amendments. I think that's a good observation. I would like to add, I would like to add though, something that <laughs> staff just handed me, and I wish I could remember all of these things on my own. Yeah. But uh, the second tranche of the President's first $20 billion does contain $175 million for the Postal Service. Oh, but uh, the so needed figure is, one, is, is $3 billion and uh, $1.1 one bill, $1 billion just to make the mail safe and, uh, and uh, purchase the equipment. So well, I think what we're saying close. here is that what we're doing today, in, in my opinion, is, uh, is the beginning, and it is not the end. It's a fairly small, I think, it's a fairly I, small beginning. Well, that's, I think that's a matter of opinion. We'll, we will see. Uh, I th Mr. Young, I think we will have a very interesting time on the floor tomorrow. Uh, you know, I suspect you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not sure that this rule will pass on the floor tomorrow. If it does, if it follows the outline that uh, that you've indicated uh, uh, in your prepared statement. Well, sir, you may be right. All I can say is I'll be there supporting the rule. I understand you will. Thank you for your time. Mr. Sessions. Uh, Chairman, I want to thank you for being here today. And you touched on some important aspects uh, of Homeland Security and the uh, <clears throat> overtime, the extra time, and the hard work that has been put in by law enforcement, uh, federal law enforcement, uh, including Coast Guard and others. Uh, it's my hope that this next year that uh, your committee will be able to focus uh, more closely on, uh, on uh, what I consider to be a national mission for us all, every single American, to understand uh, what Homeland Security is and what it means. And it's my hope, though it's not contained in what we're doing here today, it's certainly on our minds, that we will secure our borders and that uh, we will no longer allow anywhere in this country to be a sieve. We will not allow anywhere in this country, whether it's a port, whether it's a Canadian border or West Coast or anywhere, to become a sieve because it's created an undue burden uh, on each and every one of us. I was in the airport again today, as many of my colleagues were coming here. There's still a heightened sense of uh, anticipation and worry. And while, while you have provided very adequately, I believe, and properly for the military, we're fighting a war and spending time where Americans are at risk overseas. And I believe that uh, the, the time that you can invest and your committee invests as long as any authorizing committees to ensure that America understands what our law enforcement uh, government agencies are expected to perform. Uh, and we should fund that next year at that level. 
and that we should not back away and that if we have problems with Border Patrol uh, not having enough money, then we should fund it and we should do those things that are necessary. And this member, for one, uh, will be intently interested in making sure uh, that, uh, that we avoid uh, the, the, the things that we're going through today because of uh, just a nervousness and, and, and quite frankly, uh, uh, America not understanding what is the role of government, who's supposed to come in this country, who's not supposed to, uh, who challenges airplanes that come in at 200 feet, uh, who challenges people, even if it's in the middle of the desert in Arizona. And uh, I hope that, that uh, your committee uh, will take this seriously as well as all members of Congress uh, in the coming year. And I want to thank you for bringing not only this measure before us today, but for the uh, time and effort that you put into this. And I applaud you, and I intend to support not only this rule, but uh, what you're doing. And I want to thank you. Well, Mr. Sessions, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, what, what happened in New York City is something that none of us will ever forget. And Mr. Frost made two trips. I made three trips to New York City to Ground Zero uh, within just a few days of the, of the attack. Uh, I went to the Pentagon several times. Uh, I had friends at the Pentagon, people that I work with on a daily basis who are no longer alive, who died in that terrible attack. I had friends in the World Trade Center uh, who are haven't, their bodies haven't even been recovered yet. So I have a personal feeling about this, but the main feeling is my country was attacked. And when New York City was attacked, I became a New Yorker immediately, just like all of my friends sitting here who are who are from New York. But I would tell you this, I never had so much respect for the House of Representatives as I did following this attack, where the, the members, man and woman, to a member stood and said, we will do whatever is necessary, not only to apprehend and punish the perpetrators, but to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And that is a firm commitment on my part. It's a firm commitment on the part of my committee. And I think that's a firm commitment on the part of every member of this Congress. And the question was, how, how soon can we provide money? Right after that attack occurred, Mr. Roby and I sat down together, and we began to work a plan. We knew that there would be money needed uh, immediately. We sat down and worked a plan. We took it to our, our colleagues in the Senate, Senator Byrd and Senator Stevens. The four of us came out with a, with a package, which became that $40 billion supplemental. And we moved it quickly. And it moved through the House and the Senate without any real delays. And so we can move quickly, and we will move quickly, and we are doing, going to do whatever is needed to guarantee that this doesn't happen again. I was one of those, I don't know how many in this room were there on December 7th, 1941, but I was one of them. I think Charlie Rangel was, uh, was also, he and I are running around the same age. But I remember Pearl Harbor. I can tell you today where I was, what I was doing and how I felt about Pearl Harbor. And I can tell you today how I feel about what happened to America. And when it happened to America, it happened to me on September the 11th of 2001. And I just guarantee you that, that I will do whatever is needed to move whatever appropriations are needed to guarantee that we get this job done and get it done right. I appreciate, appreciate it, gentlemen. I yield back. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And Chairman Young, let me um, add my thanks uh, for the extraordinary work that you and David Obey and all the members of the Appropriations Committee do for us. I think you and I have a fundamental disagreement with reference to what the President would do in the event um, uh, that the OBE, um, uh proposed amendment were to pass. My understanding of the Obey amendment is that for $6.6 .6 billion, we can do those things that you and all of us here in Congress would like to have done that the committee bill does not do. For example, uh, the committee bill does nothing regarding federal assistance uh, for mandated security upgrades at airports. And I can't tell you in the limited time that I've been here in Congress how many times I've heard the words unfunded mandate. Uh, and yet we are participating in it by mandating things to be done and then the committee bill does nothing with reference to it. In addition, uh, Mr. Chairman, you and I represent an area of the country uh, that has 14 deep water ports. Your district, mine, uh, have those ports. The committee bill does nothing uh, for port security. A concern that uh, we have demonstrated uh, for 
other transportation uh, modalities um, uh, 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 in, in, in specifics, buses and trains. The committee bill does nothing. Um, you talk about custom security, and I heard you loud and clear, Mr. Chairman, when you said that we would have uh, the ability for an immediate response for needs tomorrow. What I take issue with is that the needs are today, and um, uh, they were created in large measure on September 11th. There isn't a man or woman seated in this um, 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 uh, room that is in Congress that would not benefit from um, uh, us doing those things now. So I don't think the president is going to veto a measure if we do those things uh, that are needed. We haven't done anything in the committee bill on federal grants for port security, um, as I indicated. We've done nothing for uh, security measures um, uh, for overseas facilities. Um, uh, nothing with reference to grants for firefighters, and yet we all go down and pontificate about how they as first responders are so vital to us, and yet in the committee bill uh, we do nothing. We do nothing for biosafety laboratories at NIH and at Fort De uh, Derrick, De Detrick uh, where they are working their brains out uh, 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 trying to assist this country. So, Mr. Chairman, you and I are not on the same page. Um, Mr. Obey and I are because, quite frankly, I don't even think that we could begin to think that something as fundamental as the Postal Service, a, a, a critical component of uh, our overall um, undertakings business-wise in this country, uh, are going to be left uh, uh, to something called a supplemental that may or may not occur at some point in the future. Every day that we do not do things, one of my colleagues, Peter Vyskolsky, is here. He was here a month ago, and since that time, businesses have gone out of business that he represents because we didn't do something now. I don't understand tomorrow. I'm talking about what's needed now. New York needs money now. The ports need money now. And can you explain to me then, Mr. Chairman, why it is we have to wait if we can do it now? Well, Mr. Hastings, my fellow Floridian, you're right about the ports, uh, but we did provide additional money in the $20 billion package for the Coast Guard, who has the port security responsibility. Uh, the Coast Guard could use more money today, but they have their O2 budget that they can work from uh, until such time as the President presents his uh, request for a supplemental. Now, you know, you, you, it's pretty hard to do, argue uh, with you on some of the things that you've mentioned, as it would be hard to argue with Mr. Roby on some of the things that he will present here this evening. Uh, but all I can tell you is we did the best we could with a $20 billion limit. And once we hit that limit, we did the best we could to adjust and readjust within the $20 billion. Uh, anything over and above that, uh, unless the House works its will in a different fashion, anything over and above that will, will come from a supplemental that would be requested by the president. Well, that's why I would be supporting the OB amendment so that the House could work its uh, uh, will. It seems to me that we, just to use a quick analogy, that uh, the boat sinks and then we're going to uh, bring it up and fix it when all it has is a leak that we could fix now and stop it from sinking. And so I just don't quite understand. Uh, I do understand the constraints uh, about that you operate with, Mr. Chairman, and I have great respect for, for you and the committee. I do not uh, agree that we should be waiting to do tomorrow what we can do today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for being here. It was very helpful. Ms. Slaughter. Sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm late. Coming in from Dallas is like a long ride over Georgia here. Um, we should enjoy that. You'll enjoy I that. Tell you, <laughs> which in my childhood was considered about one of the worst parts of our trips. But nonetheless, uh, I, I do, uh, I did very much want to get here. So that was many Young. years ago. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, pretty long time ago, Mr. Young. Uh, to say that, I, I too support. Uh, Obi's amendment, and I certainly support help for New York City. I, I am appalled that uh, we're really reneging on that to the extent that it seems to me, since it had already passed and been signed into law, 
that it's almost a matter of impoundment instead of just refusal to give over. Uh, and so I'm here to support as strongly as I can the request of my fellow New Yorkers to help us do something for our bleeding city. And I, I just want to make that statement. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting me do it. Mr. Well, Chairman, I forgot. Can I re respond sure. by saying, you know, I, I, I appreciate that. And you were here when I made my comments about mm -hmm. New York. But, and I, you can read the, read the record. Okay. I, I think you'd be uh, would, would be in agreement with what I said about New York. Uh, but I understand that there will be an amendment uh, to the $20 billion figure that would be uh, a self-executing part of this rule. Uh, I don't particularly like self-executing rules on appropriations bills, and I'll be very honest mm -hmm. with you. But in order to get this bill to, to the House and to the Senate and to conference and to the President, because none of this can be spent until we get the bill to the White House. Now, we can talk about all these grand things that we're going to do, but until that bill gets to the President's desk, nothing's going to happen. And that's why I need to get this bill to the President's desk as soon as I can. So I'm willing to go along with a self-executing rule in this case, although generically I don't really support them. But it does make uh, substantial help for New York within the $20 billion by moving money from one of, one of several accounts to to the New York account. So I, I don't disagree you are, with that. You're approving the Lowy Amendment? Is that you were pointing? Is that what? I'm sorry. Did, I'm, I'm need to, the Walsh Amendment? All right. Very good. And I, I believe that the, the chairman had announced that that would be part of the rule, would be a self-executed uh -huh. part of the rule. That's the $1.5 I yes. believe. Yes. I see. All right. Mr. So Young. We're, we're getting there. But I need to get this bill. I need a rule that can get this bill to the floor and get it to the Senate and get it to the conference and get it to the president. Otherwise, none of this gets done. So help well, me get this, help me get this we, bill we through. We appreciate that. We appreciate that. But I, I know that you understand that we feel that having worked as hard as we did to get $20 million for a city that is so desperately in need of it. And, and if you read the Times every day, and, uh, and you, the, it is unbelievable to me the pain that's going on there. Uh, and that it, what happens in that city really does affect the whole United States. It and does. And, the, and Congress was so generous in passing all that, and all we're asking is what we're entitled to. Will the gentlelady yield? Yes. Uh, the, if it's my understanding, Mr. Young, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that the $1.5 in the Walsh Amendment uh, takes money away from the national emergency grants that were provided in the bill that would go to states for unemployment insurance and for health care. So that what you're doing, you're giving New York some of the money that it was promised, but you're taking money away from states to provide unemployment benefits and health care benefits to people who've lost their jobs in order to do that. It doesn't seem like uh, a sensible way to come up with the money for New York. And I don't believe New York wants to do that. And I, 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 just think New, I believe New York wants the $20 billion. It was promised. It was passed by law and signed. I and just want to make sure that, want. That, not, more. that I haven't misstated anything, Mr. Young. Well, let me say that I was not part of that negotiation. That was a negotiation between certain members of the New York delegation and the administration. Uh, I was not part of that. So, uh, but, but have you accurately described what it does, what the Walsh Amendment does? Oh, as usual, you're fairly accurate. Thank you. <laughs> New York. <laughs> I believe. Just, uh, I, I do want to say to Mr. Young, Mr. Young, I've always found personally working with you to be a joy, and and I know that you are uh, working as hard as you can under very difficult circumstances, and I really believe you want to do what you can for New York, but this is an opportunity where we can actually produce it, and uh, it's not that we're not asking anything frivolously. This is a critical situation. This is absolutely a crisis of great magnitude, and I think speaks ill for the Congress if they turn their back on all that agony. Thanks. Gentleman from New York. I thank the Chairman. <clears throat> uh, first to Mr. Frost's inquiry, my recollection is that of the NEG money that was $1.5 uh, uh, billion that was, uh, was there, is that the uh, Committee of Jurisdiction actually authorized $3 billion, so there is an opportunity to get additional dollars back to any level that uh, would be seen fit in the, in the future on appropriation of that money. Uh, so that my understanding is of that $3 billion in authorization, $1.5 was appropriated, which uh, uh, reflects what uh, Mr. Frost has pointed out. You're talking about, the, the, again, the Walsh Amendment? In the name. Uh, that's my understanding. Mr. Chairman, I just want to thank you for 
not only your leadership and your knowledge and your experience and probably most of all your patience. Uh, these are difficult times. Uh, you and the subcommittee chair of appropriations have faced as we look at a country at war, as we look at the development of homeland security, something that we worked with our closest ally of Israel on homeland security but never had to implement quickly ourselves as well as New York City's problems, and as you have said yourself, they are many. Uh, but also the formulating of a post-Cold War military and what that means uh, to our country and the world. Uh, I've come up through the ranks as a local, county, state, and now federal legislator, and in those 27 years, I've never seen a legislative body have enough money to do all the things that need to be done or that want to be done by legislators, individually, region, states, or by coalition of viewpoint. And I think we're probably faced with that today as a number of amendments will come before the Rules Committee needing and wanting and stating the case for more money. So much as we usually hear in the 13 appropriation bills on each seg segment. This one has more emotion based on the trauma of terrorist attacks or that we're at war or that we're building a homeland security. And I just want to salute you and uh, also, Chairman Lewis, for being able to move us through the point of, of having it to the Rules Committee and onto the floor uh, so that we can uh, work the will of the House. Mr. Hastings, do you have a comment? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you for being here. Uh, you explained it clearly, and I hope you get it to the floor tomorrow. Thank we'll try and do that. Thank you. Day. Yeah, I think it will be. <laughs> Mr. Roby, welcome. You may not have to explain your amendment. It's been explained so clearly before you got here. Well, what I would just ask is that people read it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think Mr. Reynolds' comments uh, are a good place uh, uh, to take off from. He just indicated that he hoped uh, that uh, the House would be able to work its will on this bill, and that's exactly what I'm here to ask you to allow. Uh, and the only way that that can occur is if you allow uh, the same three amendments which were offered in committee to be offered on the House floor. Now, the first being the amendment by Mr. Murtha, which Mr. Frost will offer here. The second being an amendment by the New Yorkers who do not buy into the principle that we ought to either break the original of promise of $20 billion to New York, nor do they buy into the principle that you ought to rob Peter to pay Paul by, in essence, taking a billion and a half dollars away from the rest of the country to provide a token fig leaf uh, for uh, New York aid. And thirdly, to uh, uh, allow the uh, amendment providing additional funding for Homeland Security that I'm asking you to make in order. And let me walk you through uh, what this amendment is and why it is here. We have a war on two fronts. The war is going quite well in Afghanistan. From the beginning, I have made the, uh, the statement whenever asked that I thought people ought to lay off the president and let him run the war however he thought best, because uh, they would probably do a lot better job of doing it than the Congress would. And I think so far, uh, um, I think they've done a fine job. But if anyone thinks that the threat to our security is over, I invite them to have uh, additional intelligence briefings. Uh, uh, there is no reason to believe that uh, the threats to this country are not just as high today as they have been uh, uh, at any point since uh, November 11th. And that is why I'm here. Uh, what happened after uh, September 11th is that, in the first instance, the Office of Management and Budget, the White House Budget Office, asked the Congress to approve unlimited amounts of funding for an unlimited number of years, uh, uh, so long as that money was being spent uh, on, ter uh, on anti-terrorist activities. Mr. Young and I, uh, uh, acting uh, uh, in our capacity as chairman and ranking member of the Appropriations Committee, said, no, we're not going to do that. 
We will provide you a down payment until we can get our act together and have a better understanding of what needs to be provided long term. And that was provided. Uh, we had negotiated, uh, Mr. Young and Mr. Uh, and I and uh, Senator Stevens and Byrd had been negotiating a package of around 30 to 32 billion dollars. Uh, we had assumed that New York would be needing about 10 to 12 billion dollars. Uh, those are the estimates that we'd been given uh, right after the attack. Word was then passed into the meeting that the president, in fact, had personally guaranteed $20 billion for New York. And uh, uh, when several members of the other body uh, tried to blow up the agreement uh, uh, by suggesting that that was too much money, Mitch Daniels uh, himself, the president's budget director, when asked whether or not language which said up to $20 billion for New York would be consistent with the president's promise, said no, the promise was $20 billion. I hope that this House will keep that promise without draining a billion and a half dollars away from other states who have suffered increases in unemployment, as would occur under the self-executing provision of the rule which is being recommended uh, by, uh, by the leadership, evidently. Um, secondly, I want to make clear, everyone from the president on down, and if you don't believe me, I've got the quotes, I can give them to you. Everyone from the president on down to the leadership of this House, to Mr. Young and myself, all indicated that the $40 billion was merely a down payment and that more money would be needed. There was no agreement to limit national security funding in the light of this attack to $40 billion. This was a down payment in contrast to the original request for unlimited funding from the administration. And I find it ironic that the same administration, which just two months ago was asking for unlimited amounts of funds for an unlimited number of years, is now suggesting that they will veto a bill if we give them $6 billion more. Thirdly, I want to point out that every single dollar that, that I'm asking you to, uh, to allow us uh, to uh, put to the House in this amendment, every single dollar could not be spent unless the President himself determined that it fit an emergency definition and should be spent. For every single line item in my amendment, we contain language which says that that, that money shall not be spent unless the President himself certifies that that is an emergency. It, it's, so, it's so that money is provided on a contingent basis. So there is no threat of runaway spending associated with this amendment because the person who will control the rate of spending and control which items are actually uh, 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 funded will be the President of the United States. We simply make it available because we do not believe that is in the national interest for us to wait another six or eight or nine months before we pass a supplemental. Now, B uh, Bill Young, my good friend, uh, is carrying a banner on behalf of his leadership that says in big red letters, WAIT, W-A-I-T. I know in his heart he doesn't want to do that. Uh, 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 what we, we started to put together on a bipartisan basis, this document after, after the events of September 11th, our staffs worked on a bipartisan basis to put together a document which labeled security items on the basis of Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3. Tier 1 and 2 were the items that were either already going to be funded or items that both of our staffs agreed should be funded. Tier 3, uh, tier, uh, three represented the items uh, which we had not yet finished discussing, and so we didn't know whether we agreed on them. When Mr. Uh, uh, Young got the signal from his leadership to back out of that uh, cooperative arrangement, then we had no choice but to proceed on our own. I told my staff to, t to strip all of the usual baloney items that you get from an agency every time they have an excuse to get more money. I ordered them to strip out every single item uh, that was not absolutely crucial 
and tied tightly to the question of homeland defense. And then when they got down to an absolutely irreducible number, I told them to then cut that in half so that people understood we were serious about funding only what, what is important. And I want you to understand what is in this amendment. Secretary Thompson has told us that, and he said it just last week, that, uh, that uh, our uh, protection against bioterrorism is in tatters. His words, not mine. And I, uh, I would invite every member of this committee to call the chief health officer in your states and ask them how many of your counties are prepared to meet a terrorist attack in the chem bio field. You will be shocked at what you will be told. So what we provide is about a billion dollars additional for upgrading state and local health departments and to provide additional biosafety laboratories. Right now, we have only three four, uh, level four biosafety labs in the country. Fort Detrick has already stretched the capacity. We desperately need more laboratories, or if we get hit with other, other uh, uh, attacks like we've had with anthrax, we won't even be able to run the tests necessary to know what's going on. I don't think we want to stay in that position very long. Uh, for securing the mail, the post office is pursuing one of three alternate, uh, alternate strategies, uh, which they estimate will cost about $3 billion in, in order to uh, uh, sterilize the mail. We want to provide $500 uh, uh, million as a down payment. And that money cannot be spent until the post office comes back to Congress with a specific plan for spending it. Airport and airline safety. The bill before you, uh, because of the committee action, increases the amount of money that is provided above the president's request for, uh, for uh, uh, sky marshals but it pays for it by cutting the president's request for, for cabin safety. So we've got a, 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 a uh, uh, you know, an on the cheap solution for cabin safety until we get more money. We think we ought to fully fund <clears throat> both items. And so we add $200 million uh, for, for cockpit door security and explosive detection equipment. Law enforcement. The FBI's computer system is pitiful. Uh, they, they have uh, enormous gaps in their ability to pursue the investigations they're engaged in right now because of the inadequacies of that uh, computer system. They are trying to replace it with a system called Trilogy. They will not, without my amendment, be able to, to do that until the year 2004. Under our amendment, they would be able to finish it by next summer. I think it's crucial they be allowed to do that. We also want to provide the FBI and other agencies uh, 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 the capacity to, to have a backup for the data which they are now collecting on, on their investigations. Uh, because right now their backup capacity is woefully inadequate. Uh, weapons uh, of mass destruction, keeping them away from terrorists. Uh, the president himself has said that Mr. Bin Laden is trying to get his hands on chem bio and nuclear material. I have a sheet here which shows the number of times that we detected weapons-grade nuclear material after it had uh, uh, fallen into the wrong hands. In, 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 thank you. In eight of those, uh, on eight of those occasions, that weapons-grade material was smuggled out of Russia, and it was discovered only after it was out of Russia. There are five other instances in which, in fact, it's 13 in total, there are five other instances where, uh, where that same kind of material was, uh, was recovered after it left Russia. We don't know how many times uh, uh, that material fell into the wrong hands and was not recovered. Uh, we are asking. Uh, that we provide additional funding, some $446 million to upgrade security for nuclear weapons activities and some $190 million for a nuclear nonproliferation assistance for Russia. Uh, uh, that is an enormous security threat to this country. Uh, border security, someone mentioned border security over here. 
We're asking for 790 additional customs agents at the Canadian border. You've had 64 points of entry in this country. Talk about leakage. We've got Niagara Falls. You've got 64 points of entry in this country on the Canadian border alone that are not open 24 hours a day. And, they, and the deterrent is a sign saying, do not enter, X thousand dollar fine, and an orange traffic cone. Uh, you know, fairly useless. Now that is now being corrected, but in the process, that means that our other entry points are going to be strained to the breaking point. Customs can put people on now to relieve that strain if we provide the, if we provide the money, and we should. Port security. We only inspect about 2% of all the cargo containers that come in this country. An enormous security risk. Uh, uh, we are asking for the money to provide 800 additional custom service agents for cargo inspection. Uh, uh, they probably need twice that much. We're also asking to, uh, to, uh, to provide the full annual cost of expanding the Coast Guard by 640 positions. This bill only pays for half-year costs for those items, not full-year costs. And then we are asking that we do something about uh, uh, a problem that uh, Tommy Thompson, my good friend, says worries him more than anything else, which is the fact that right now only 1% of the imported food in this country is inspected. We have enough money in our amendment to raise that to 10%. That's hardly blanket coverage. And then we have additional funding to help uh, protect our national uh, uh, water uh, supply. and. Uh, and uh, 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 we also provide additional assistance. Uh, airports have been mandated to implement over $500 million in additional security actions, uh, but they've been given no money to do it. We provide $200 million to help uh, pay for that cost. I want to address the issue of why this should not wait for a supplemental by asking you one question. When's the last time you ever saw a senator say he would vote for an appropriation bill if he took something out? When's the last time? What they usually say is, well, I'll vote for it, but I want this added, or I want this added. Right now, you have an opportunity to put this through in a way which is disciplined. I dare you to find one item in this package that is in any way related to pork, or anything except hardcore national security needs, you aren't going to be able to find one because it isn't there. And, but uh, and, and right now we can keep people focused on the on the bare bones necessities to protect this country. But uh, if you wait for a supplemental, first of all, we have no idea how long it will take. We may very well be able to finish it quickly in this house. Uh, but what is going to happen to that supplemental when every group that loses an argument in the remainder of this session, whether it's on the farm bill or anything else, when they decide, aha, here's my opportunity to attach a must, uh, an amendment to a must-pass piece of legislation. This place has uh, <coughs> phenomenal ability to get tied up in, uh, in knots like that. Um, and so to me, your best way of assuring that, that you don't have a runaway budget is to not run another supplemental through this place. Besides which, it would be kind of nice if for the first four months of next year, we didn't have to chew the same cud over again. It would be kind of nice if we could do what we need to do now on security items so that in February and March, we can deal with things such as uh, missile defense questions, we can deal with uh, education, health care, social security, all of the things we said were important before we all, uh, of necessity, became Johnny One Notes on, on security issues. So uh, I'm asking you uh, uh, to give uh, uh, us the opportunity. I'm not even asking you to vote for the amendment, but I am saying this is a grave national security issue, and I am asking you to give us the opportunity to at least have it voted on on the House floor. That's, I, th I think it's an eminently reasonable request. Thank you, David. Um, in your reviewing of the Mirtha Frost Amendment and your amendment, 
They're both about a six and a half billion dollars in new money. Is that correct? Yeah. And they're, the um, the Mirtha Frost Amendment is more military. Is that correct? Yeah, Jack deals with the day-to-day. -day def uh, he deals with the Defense Department-related costs. Example on on <laughs> nuclear uh, non-proliferation. His amendment deals with the Defense Department uh, portion of that program. I deal with the Dep Department of Energy portion of that uh, of that program. Thank you, Mr. Diaz Ballard. No, uh, I. Uh I think Mr. Obi was very clear and exhaustive, and I, uh, I uh, appreciate his remarks very much. Mr. Frost. Mr. Obi, just a, a brief question or two. Um, and this relates to the port security issue that you testified about. Now, the Port of Houston is ranked first in the United States in foreign waterborne <clears throat> commerce, second in total tonnage, and overall eighth in the world. Uh, in the uh, year 2000, 175 million tons of cargo moved through the port with a total of 6,800 vessel calls. The top import and export commodity is petroleum and petroleum <coughs> products. The Coast Guard estimates that half of all dangerous and high interest cargo moves through the Houston chip channel. Now, if I understand what the, uh, the, the bill does, that the President requested uh, two hundred and three million dollars to cover six months of increased activity by the Coast Guard that the committee um, re uh, committee uh, figure falls fifty eight million dollars short right. of even the president's request that's right and that your amendment fully funds the president's request and provides an additional one hundred and sixty five million dollars to fund this activity throughout all of fiscal year two thousand and two. My concern is how can we not safeguard our ports at this point? A, um, a, an accident or a sabotage uh, in a port like Houston involving petroleum products could cause innumerable deaths and could cause wreck great havoc through the entire Gulf Coast. And, and how can the administration justify and how, how, can, the, how can the committee justify cutting the administration's request, which is really not even enough at this point. Well, let me simply say that I think Bill Young tried to do his dead level best within the artificial ceiling imposed upon him uh, uh, to allocate resources in the way that he thought was uh, going to best protect the country. And so I think he had to make some hard choices. And that meant cutting some things that shouldn't be cut. And I think he will be the first to admit that, uh, that these things shouldn't be cut. Uh, so I do not uh, attack the choices he made. But I do point out that because of the artificial choices, this bill on cockpit door security is $250 million below the president's request. Uh, on protection for federal buildings around the, uh, around the country, it's $150 million below the president's request. Uh, Coast Guard is $58 million below the request, and White House security itself is $50 million below the White, uh, White House request. So um, uh, what Bill tried to do is to fund other higher priorities. Uh, these are some of the uh, uh, unfortunate results when you don't have enough funding uh, uh, to, uh, to start out with. And, Mr. Obey, I know you're not here to testify primarily on the amendment that I will be offering on behalf of Mr. Martha. But if I understand correctly what the committee did, uh, the committee basically took OMB cuts to uh, Department of Defense and CIA requests uh, that were made for our military and for intelligence. And if I understand correctly, um, the committee cut a billion, over a billion dollars for the special forces. Now, these are the folks who are on the ground right now in Afghanistan. Now, the amendment to be offered that I will offer uh, restores 755 million of that. And the committee cut money for munitions, ammunition for the Marine Corps. Now, these are the folks who've just been uh, dispatched to Afghanistan, and um, the uh, 
the request, uh, the OMB cut was $817 million uh, that the uh, OMB made uh, to the Defense Department's request for ammunition, small arms ammunition for the Marine Corps and the Army. And uh, we restored a portion of that. I don't understand, as a general proposition, why the committee just swallowed these cuts that were made by the Defense Department, the requests made by the Defense Department, and cuts made by OMB at the very time that we're fighting this war. It makes no sense to me. I'll make you a bet. You know what happens when uh, uh, witnesses appear, any administration witness appears before a congressional committee on an appropriation item. If, if we want to know what they really believe as opposed to what OMB has ordered them to say, we ask them the following question. Would you, sir, in your best professional judgment, tell us what is uh, needed to take care of this problem? And I think that if, if uh, uh, I think the only reason that those cuts are there is because our majority friends on the Appropriations Committee were not allowed to use their best professional judgment. When I was at the White House, I said this to the President to try to distinguish between what party leaders were, were doing and what the Appropriations Committee leaders were trying to do. I said, look, when we get elected, all we have proven is that we know how to get elected. We haven't proven that we have any expertise. But we come to Congress, we get a committee assignment, we develop expertise, and we apply that, we hope, for the benefit of the country. The problem you have is that in this instance, even though the leadership of this committee on a bipartisan basis in both the House and the Senate agreed that we needed uh, this additional funding. On a substantive basis, a political judgment was made by other parties that that committee would not be allowed to bring its professional opinion to bear on what was needed in these instances. And so we essentially, in my view, have politics versus substance. Uh, here and, and the question is whether or not we're going to be able to have a substantive debate on the House floor on these issues. Mr. Ridge himself has said he knows that he's going to have to, have to ask for a supplemental for billions. I have great respect for him. Uh, I think he will have the president's ear because he's a good friend of the president. And I hope he can bring order out of chaos. But he, he, the, the brightest human being in the world is going to need time to get up to speed on some of these issues. He's been busy being governor of Pennsylvania. Uh, all I'm saying is just because he needs time to decide for himself what needs to be done in five or six areas, that doesn't relieve us of our responsibilities to take action now if we have a pretty good idea of what the needs are. And we have, uh, we have scrubbed uh, each and every agency account. And virtually every item you see here is based on information that we got not only from agency uh, uh, briefs, but from, uh, I mean from agency uh, budget submissions, but from uh, classified briefings uh, about some very serious security gaps, which I can't even talk about in a, in a public session. Uh, I find particularly alarming uh, your testimony about the cuts in uh, cockpit security on airlines uh, designed to uh, combat terrorist attacks like the one that occurred on September 11th. Mr. Obies, I think you're aware and some other people here in the room are aware, my, my wife is in the Army. My wife's boss was killed at the Pentagon and two people on my wife's staff were killed at the Pentagon in that attack. And I take this very personal. I don't blame you. I had uh, four constituents killed, uh, three at the Pentagon, one in New York, one just a young uh, fellow who just started working in, in New York uh, uh, at the beginning of his life, two weeks earlier. Uh, 
I don't criticize the choice that if I had been in Bill's shoes and had to choose between adding more people for Sky Marshals or, or a, a, a temporarily cutting short on cockpit security, I probably, if I had to make that choice, would have made the same choice that Bill made because I think Sky Marshals was a higher priority. But I don't think we ought to have to make that choice. I would agree with you. I mean, those are two key requirements, and the public has a right to know that we're not putting a wait till next year sign on matters that are of, uh, of crucial national uh, import. I have no further questions. Mr. Hastings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, this is always part of the uh, congressional session where decisions have to be made. It gets down to kind of crunch time or waiting for the last appropriation bill. And, David, I, I really admire the way you have worked with the chairman on all the appropriation bills, uh, in, including including this one. Uh, ultimately, we'll we'll get through it. We we do have to fund those uh, necessary areas. Defense being uh, what this bill is all about, being the one that has to be uh, funded uh, for our military. We have to not only do that for their sake, but also to send a, a signal. Your your argument, by by and large, at least on behalf of your amendment. Uh, and you outlined a number of things in there that hardly anybody could agree with that needs to be uh, addressed. The administration, of course, has, has taken a position of uh, not necessarily disagreeing with you, but let's come back and after we can fine-tune it and be able to maybe sharpen a pencil here or there or emphasize other areas over, over uh, uh, other areas that may, may not be, need to be funded as much. But your argument is let's, let's, get, uh, let's get by that. Uh, let's put this in so we don't have to have the supplemental. Uh, let me just ask you a question as a member of the Appropriation Committee. If your amendment were made in order, and if it were to pass, and if the, then the administration comes back and says, gee, we need more, would you oppose a supplemental then uh, four or five months from now? Well, not if the administration had persuasive arguments. Obviously not. I mean, let me make the, this, this point. This amendment, all we are doing with this amendment is saying, look, it, make it available to the president so that, so that we don't have something pop. I mean, right now, the Coast Guard is ready to hire these people. The Customs Service is ready to hire these people. They can't until they get the money. Much is made of the fact that uh, only $4.3 billion has been appropriated so far. That's because OMB has only released $7 billion. The agencies can't spend the money until OMB signs off on it. So, I mean, uh, that's a meaningless number they give us. Not a dime can be spent here until the president decides it's an emergency. So if the president decides he wants to wait on all of it, he has that authority. All we're saying is we don't know how long it's going to take to pass the supplemental, but these are areas that we know have huge security holes right now. And we ought to make the money available to the president on a contingency basis. And then if he doesn't want to use it, he's the commander in chief. He's made the judgment. But at least it's available to him so that they don't have to come back to us in a panic if something else happens. Yeah, I, and, and I understand it. And, and it's ironic, uh, you know, laying out the scenario that you just laid out. Because the commander in chief says, let's wait until we, you know, get uh, the numbers. And maybe that's always going to be a conflict between... Uh, the legislative uh, branch and the executive branch, and uh, uh, but that's the, I mean this is where we are and this is the decision we have to make. But I I just wanted to ask that uh, that question uh, uh, if uh, if as an appropriator you would uh, you would you would feel that you we didn't have to come back with a uh, uh, an appropriation even if it were uh, uh, the same amount you, as what you had. You never know what's final, but the world can change in five minutes. Right, exactly. Uh, but but the problem is, I ask you to. Do one thing. I beg you to read each and every item and the rationale for those items in our supplemental views. And then ask yourself one question. What is the bigger risk to the country, doing this or not doing this? Okay. Hey, listen, again, I admire uh, what you've done uh, uh, in the way you've worked uh, with the chairman on this, and, uh, and you know, decision will have to be made, and, and we will, but I admire the work that you've done. Thank you. I, I mean, I did, if you ask Bill 
You know, if you ask the chairman, I think he, he will tell you the same thing that I, I'm going to say. We both thought that we were going to be allowed to develop a bipartisan package, and we thought it'd take about 15 minutes to adopt as a manager's amendment in the full committee. I was absolutely flabbergasted when I was told it without even being given an opportunity to explain what we wanted to, to have done, that we were going to be facing a veto. I do not understand that. No further questions. Ms. Lutter? Mr. Obi, I, uh, I want to certainly express my support for your amendment. I, one issue I want to bring up is customs, uh, because my district uh, lies adjacent to that major boarding crossing, border crossing with Canada. Um, and we're pretty much aware of the problems that can, can occur there. Uh, after September 11th, one of the four international bridges that uh, goes from the Buffalo area into Canada was closed. And the INS and customs officers there were transferred to another border crossing to, right. to tighten up. And we were told that was only temporary. But as I understand it, uh, unless your amendment passes, there is no money in there to, to hire more customs officers. Is that correct? On customs, um, what we are trying to, let me, let me make sure that I give you an accurate, uh, there is $80 million in the bill for uh, um, uh, additional customs agents for the Canadian border. Wasn't that uh, diverted to airport safety? Um, you mean by the committee? Yes. Uh, I do not believe so. So you still, you do have 80? I think the, the committee still has $80 million. We have $145 million. Mm -hmm. they, have, they have hired, uh, I think the committee has made available some, uh, some money to hire a few additional uh, people. I see. But far, uh, uh, far below what customs uh, uh, say they need. Mm -hmm. And the pro uh, Buffalo, for instance, has the second highest volume of any por uh, point of entry uh, on the Canadian can border. Wait hours so the to the get worst across. being Detroit. It's, yes, it's and awful. You've had the problem, and people talk about an economic stimulus package, for God's sake. You can start by simply eliminating the traffic delays for bringing parts in uh, uh, that manufacturers need to keep their plants going the economy, in this country. Yeah. Uh, and you've had a huge hang-up in Buffalo. You had that at, at Detroit and other places around the country. I, I remember reading a comment that Senator Dorgan had made from North Dakota that the only thing that guards his border after dark is a yellow cone. Um, and it seems to me that we might, if we want to talk about internal security and homeland security, I'd be giving a little bit more thought to those borders. So I, I do support your amendment. I think it's a critical that we do that. Thank you. Mr. Sessions. Mr. Hastings. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and let me add my thanks, David, uh, to the extraordinary work that you and uh, your staff uh, have done and for the bipartisan cooperation shown in working uh, with Chairman Young. Uh, to support your amendment is very easy for me. As you point out, there are 14 deep water ports in Florida. Um, uh, many members of um, uh, the port and their representatives appeared before the Florida delegation three weeks ago and expressed serious urgency. My question uh, to you is, in your opinion, based on uh, yours and your staff's work, what is uh, the state of uh, security at the various ports in the United States, including those in New York? Uh, I think it's woefully inadequate. Um, I mean, it, port security involves a number of things. First of all, making sure that uh, ships that come in uh, to ports uh, don't have uh, uh, nuclear material or other kinds of bombs that could uh, blow away the port itself. Secondly, you want to make sure that the cargo that's in those, uh, in the, in those ships is safe uh, uh, if it's going to be distributed uh, within the United States. Um, and that brings into question not only uh, your, your, you know, your normal hard commercial products, but, but the nation's <coughs> food supply. Uh, when, we, when we inspect only 1% of all of the food uh, that's imported in this country, uh, I think that's a huge potential problem. And when you recognize that out of uh, the, uh, about 400 ships a day that dock into this country, we inspect, uh, uh, we fully inspect less than 20 of them, uh, that doesn't uh, 
make me rest very easy at night. And isn't it also true that criminal organizations at this time are exploiting uh, the weaknesses uh, in our ports? No question. Now, it's been said here that the president would veto this measure, and I know none of us have any way of knowing exactly what will happen. Uh, Mr. Young and I had an exchange, and I expressed my uh, view uh, that I did not think that if your measure was made in order and it passed the House and the Senate, uh, that the president would veto it. What's your assessment um, of whether or not a veto um, uh, would obtain in the event your measure were made in order and it passed? Well, I was so flabbergasted by the, by the initial statement that I still have no, no idea what, in fact, is going on uh, uh, with OMB and the White House. Right. Well, All I know is that uh, uh, I, 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 I find it surprising that in the middle of a war, when I would think we would want to stay as close together as possible. I find it surprising that we are told that um, uh, uh, the White House's mind was closed before we ever had an opportunity to speak to them for one second about what it is we were proposing. I normally don't close my mind until I at least know what my choices are. I hear you. Uh, the measure that you offer um, provides $915 million to improve security at ports. It provides $147 million for 841 new customs inspectors. It provides $917.5 million for airline and airport safety and $500 million more than the committee bill, I uh, might add and provides uh, funding, as you have pointed out, uh, for reinforcement of cockpit doors on airplanes and provides $200 million to assist in uh, avoiding unfunded mandates. Um, do you perceive, um, as I do, Mr. Obey, that we do have the money and that these matters are of such critical urgency that there is no need to wait for a supplemental that could wind up uh, being counterproductive in terms of um, uh, trying to decrease spending? Well, I would answer that question by asking a question. It's been estimated by Joseph Stieglitz, who just won the Nobel Prize for Economics, that uh, the recession, which we're now uh, experiencing, will wind up blowing a $385 billion <coughs> hole in the economy this year. Now, I don't know how much you would ascribe, uh, how much of that hole you would ascribe to the events associated uh, with September 11th and, there, and, it, and, and thereafter, right. but certainly a significant portion. Uh, I would ask whether or not it isn't worth <coughs> spending six and a half billion dollars to avoid economic damage many times larger than that not to mention the human carnage and human pain associated with uh, uh, not uh, covering our bases on these items. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the defense budget, for instance, for years, we've had, I mean, my main argument with the defense budget for years has been that it has been focused on very costly big ticket items that were aimed at fighting the last war while we weren't adjusting fast enough to the new uh, asymmetrical, uh, asymmetrical threats like terrorism and the rest that uh, Secretary Rumsfeld was uh, trying to warn about after he took over at the Pentagon. Right. And, and to me, uh, this is just a continuation of that myopia if we don't provide uh, funding for these items. Well, I certainly pray that your amendment um, uh, will be made in order. And I know this much. Uh, for all of us uh, that stood by as we went about our business, of uh, allowing for a, a substantial uh, tax cut in this country, recognizing most of us here in Congress that we were in a recession in the first place, and we didn't have to wait for some committee of academics uh, 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 to come forward and tell us what we already knew. And we also know that we're getting ready to experience extraordinary difficulties. That said, 
Um, I, I, for one, believe that if we had a 10-year plan to offer tax breaks, that we could have a, a one-month plan to try to put some of these things in place right now and not wait until some uh, date in the future to take care of matters that are of critical concern. And I thank you, Mr. Ovey, and I thank you, Mr. Well, Chairman. I would just, I would just yeah. respond by saying I don't know what the next step is going to be in, the, in, in this war against terrorism. Uh, I hope that things come to a rapid, pleasant conclusion in Afghanistan. We've still got a, sig a significant way to go on that. But there are some people in this country who are talking about carrying it to other countries, carrying it to Iraq, for instance. If we are even thinking about something like that, we would be absolute fools if we do not do everything possible to protect the home front by securing ports, securing borders, increasing the capacity of our public health system because the other fellows aren't just going to be sitting there while we're going for their throat. They're going to be trying to uh, uh, retaliate and, uh, and deter us. And we need to every day, uh, uh, one story, when I'm, I'm down at the FBI and I'm talking to this fellow and he's telling me, I've, you know, I've got I've got this information about the cell here, and I've got this financial trail here, and we've, we've got these intercepts here. There's a story here. He said, I can't quite put it together. I'm having a hell of a time sleeping at night because I keep thinking if I could just solve it one day earlier that I might save an awful lot of lives. Well, to me, it's true of the FBI. It's true of Customs. It's true of Coast Guard. Uh, there is no reason to delay this especially when we're giving the president absolute, virtually item veto authority on every single one of these items. Mr. Reynolds. I thank the gentleman for his viewpoints. David, thank you again. You're always clear and forthright, and uh, I enjoyed your presence. Thank, thank you. Later this morning on Washington Journal, we'll talk about the defense spending bill that's coming to the House floor when they return at 10 a.m. Eastern. Joining us will be Appropriations Committee Ranking Member David Obey of Wisconsin. Also a look at the recent